Oh, hi. Hello there. Happy Pride Month. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm your host, Liv, here in June, as always, with as much LGBTQIA content as I, as I can find. You all know this by now, but one of my favorite things to do is share these stories from the ancient world that affirm that a broad spectrum of gender and sexuality existed in the ancient world. Just as broad a spectrum as exists now. It's almost like it's just human nature not to fit into binaries. Weird, I know. I also know that sometimes people criticize that I only do this during June, uh, Pride Month, and I just want to say again that I totally understand this criticism. It is valid in theory, but I'm not doing it just to appease or or like be another rainbow username only for the month of June. Uh, it's just simply that there are a finite number of these stories because it's Greek myth, um, and it's nice to just put them all together in a big celebratory month. It's just, it's fun, honestly, for all of us. So I do it this way. But if and when I ever hear from experts who want to share their knowledge when it comes to LGBTQIA concepts or characters, I am always happy to have these people on any time of the year. In this case, it just happens that I spoke to Charlotte Gregory, today's amazing guest, so close to June that I thought it was just all too fun to be able to feature everyone's favorite couple, Achilles and Patroclus, right at the beginning of Pride. Plus, it meant that I could air this episode right after my episode on Plato's Symposium and the notion of soulmates, because that episode itself was inspired by this conversation. So Charlotte Gregory is doing her PhD in basically Achilles and Patroclus. How fucking cool is that? Okay, specifically, she's doing her PhD in modern reception of Achilles and Patroclus, and honestly, I'm just as here for that. Needless to say, I leapt at the chance to have this conversation, and Charlotte and I had <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> we talked about Song of Achilles, of course, and 2004's Troy, because, you know, cousins, uh, and Troy, Fall of a City, and just Achilles and Patroclus and everything surrounding their relationship and all its varied interpretations. If I know my listeners at all, you all are going to fucking love this episode. So let's just get right into it, shall we? Conversations. So are they cousins or not? The love of Achilles and Patroclus with Charlotte Gregory. Well, then let's talk about Achilles and, and Patroclus. So that's, I mean, my listeners are going to die for this episode. I don't think I've ever had oh, one oh. where I officially talk to a guest. Yeah, like, no pressure, I guess. <laughs> I realize I'm starting it off with that. But yeah, uh, I mean, they are it, especially because you're talking about them you know, or you, you study them in a more modern context. So I want to mm. hear kind of generally everything. But like, how did you come to the, this is your PhD is them in this context? I love that. So um, it sort of started, it was uh, during the last year of my undergrad, um, I was not sure if I wanted to pursue classics, like academia. I was kind of tired of it all, especially exams and all that. Um, and I thought maybe I would go into perhaps film and TV I was really interested in for a while. Uh, and then I found this module taught by a lecturer. I was at the Uni of St. Andrews. And he taught this module on like classics in the modern world. And it covered so many, like from sort of education system and um, Black Athena, post-colonial receptions, and then classics in film and TV. And I went, oh, I can merge my interest areas. And then uh, during my master's, I got him as my supervisor and we brainstormed what I was wanting to do a dissertation on. And we kept coming back to queer, <laughs> queer <laughs> and film and TV and uh it kind of came from this uh, analysis of masculinity uh, in antiquity and se masculine sexualities. 
and then their receptions. And then for the PhD, it's kind of a continuation, but with a greater focus on Achilles and Patroc. Well, specifically Achilles as a case study across different mediums. So I'm interested in how medium impacts these receptions. And so Patroclus, the amount I talk about him varies depending on uh, what film, book, uh, video game I'm looking at. That's so fun and just makes me think of Troy, uh, the movie, yes. because I feel like that's got to be like your big thing of like, well, you can't talk I'm... about Patroclus all that much in that. <laughs> exactly. I've, I've just uh, writing my chapter on Troy. So it's film and then Troy's the main case study. So um, it, there's a lot more about Briseis in that. But I, I've I've done so much analysis of Brad Pitt and his sex image. It's um, I'm literally at one point I'm talking about the Angelina Jolie Jennifer Aniston drama. I'm like, I'm sat next to someone who's doing uh, Greek linguistics in the common room, and um, then there's me basically like a tabloid journalist, <laughs> and I'm wondering how I've got to this stage. I'm loving it, but. Yeah, I feel like it's very, yeah, not not the norm, maybe, in terms of studying <laughs> classics. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> but it's fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like I connect with that very well. Just I do the fun stuff, too, where it's just, like, you know, deeply not academic, but just, like, talking about the fun parts. Or it's kind of nice to have that sort of separation that, when you, that you get when you talk about reception, because you don't mm-hmm. have to stick to this, like, rigidity you know that obviously exists in terms of ancient sources and re- and the, the study of them whereas reception you get to kind of play around with everything um especially with these characters exactly and it's fun because I don't really then have to deal with you know questions of accuracy or anything I'm more interested in if something's inaccurate so to speak or varying I get to kind of just be like okay but why why have they made these decisions and try and sort of explore that which I think's fun and interesting um, rather than being so stuck in the ancient texts themselves. I do enjoy the ancient texts, but it's been a while since I've read them vigorously. Yeah. It's nice to have like a little of both. And yeah, I mean, I, I like the kind of combo and I like reading the ancient texts and then kind of yeah, considering beyond them or especially when it comes to Achilles and Patroclus, like they are so interesting because people have such strong feelings and ideas yeah. about them and like I'm sure I mean so one of the reasons I even have you is that I, I I forget kind of which happened first but basically at some point since we planned this all I've seen on your Twitter is just like constant like <laughs> reception of Achilles and Patroclus and it's it's fascinating to see that and I'm also good friends um internet friends with um with Ben who runs the oh, yeah. classical studies memes account and so obviously like, he gets a lot of that too and and it's it's so fascinating. So I mean, you're you're studying the queerness specifically. So is that kind of like the way you wanted to come at it? Is sort of emphasizing the queerness, or just sort of studying all of it? It's sort of looking at. Um, so the queerness, I think, comes through the most in receptions of them. But um, I'm also interested in so Troy the explicitly trying to position him uh, as this very hyper heterosexual figure is how they do it. And I find that also interests me. I'm just kind of generally interested in all kinds of masculinity um, and their various sexualities that they entail. Uh, But there's definitely, the queer definitely comes through the most, I would say. So even with Troy, I talk about um, a homoerotic reading of Troy and how they're clearly trying to uh, suppress this queer reading, but they cannot it still creeps through, um, which is fun to sort of analyze. Yeah, I, I noticed that in a rewatch of of 300 recently too, which is from like the same time period. And they do the same thing where it's like, and you know, it, it's it, it's the mid 2000s. Like, I, I feel like I also, like I was a teenager and I just have such a grasp on like what it was like back then. And you can kind of like see, ex- you can just like, you know, know exactly why and how everything happened the way that it did, especially compared to now, which is sort of fascinating. But both of them mm-hmm. are these like super heterosexual, like absolutely no queerness. They're just getting rid of it entirely. And then, yeah, like you said, they can't actually fully get rid of it because the gaze is like there really heavily. It's, it is. It's exactly, it comes down to the gaze. Um, so part of my thesis, I'm looking at, um, the idea of the male gaze and one of the issues of films like Troy is they are these masculine film genres aimed predominantly at male audiences 
but they have the male body on display. And that's inherently kind of, it causes these problems for the audience because you have men looking at the male body as this, because Brad Pitt in Troy is definitely meant to be an object of desire. I mean, it's Brad Pitt. He was a world sexiest man twice. He's only like four celebrities have ever had that title. He is, that's what he's known for. And so when you have a male audience watching this, they have to then come up with these techniques to try and su suppress sort of the queerness of men watching other men and their bodies. And so that's why you get Briseis, you get those, um, the first scene where he's naked in bed with two women, not one, two. That's how like, he's so heterosexual and manly. <laughs> and it plays into this image of him almost as like a rock star figure like sleeping around, he's, he's so good at what he does. Um, I just, I love it, but it still creeps through. They've got him in the shortest skirt possible. And um, yes, and the scenes with Patroclus, it still creeps through. Like when uh, he introduces Odysseus to Patroclus and the way he does it is he holds uh, Patroclus by uh, the wrists so both wrists in one hand and he holds a sword to his back and pushes him. So Patroclus has kind of uh, presented to Odysseus with his chest out. And um, firstly, I was like, okay, well, you know, kind of kinky holding him by the wrist. The sword at the back is obviously phallic. And the way he's positioned made me really think of these paintings of St. Sebastian where he's bound with his wrist behind and he's always got his chest out. And then that St. Sebastian thing carries through to the end when Achilles is killed by multiple arrows. And St. Sebastian is, uh, what was it? A friend said to me, uh, he's the patron saint of twinks is how he described him. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty queer. <laughs> I love these. I've never, you know, I've never like, it's been a long time since I've watched Troy. Unfortunately, I also do want to like kind of, I might mention this in the introduction too, but like, obviously there's a, unfortunately a lot of shit around Brad Pitt. Now he seems like he's kind of a super yeah. problematic piece of garbage. Um, so I just want to like recognize that, that I know that, but also, you know, we, we can, can, can and should still talk about Troy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's one of those things I've been wondering about whether to sort of discuss that in the thesis, because I'm talking, but I'm talking about his star image a lot and what that, uh, brought to the role and how that influences people's perceptions of Achilles and his masculinity and sexuality. So I've been a bit umming and ahhing over whether to add a thing, sort of a disclaimer, because it does sound like I'm praising him nonstop in my thesis, being like, you know, world's sexiest man. He had two most beautiful women. He's um, in all these major roles and all this sort of stuff. And I kind of want to be like, I'm not saying he's a good person. I don't, I, you know, there's a lot going on, but... It's yeah. I'm not sure if it bears relevance to my thesis because it is from 2004 and five. I'm really talking about. Well, and yeah, and I mean, 2004 and five. Brad Pitt is such a different person. Like, obviously, he's still kind mm. of got everything around him. So, and we won't. You know, I, I don't want to like dwell on that. I just want to make sure I said it and didn't pretend like I didn't know. Um, but yeah. like, 2004, 2005. Brad Pitt was like a, a time in itself. Like. Mm. Uh, grew up watching friends all of the time and for the longest time what my favorite episode to rewatch is when he is on <laughs> it's the best episode um, oh, yeah. it, it's just like between yeah him and jennifer aniston and then the angelina jolie of it all which had to have been happening around that time it is so at the time that troy came out that was in may 2004 and that is when the rumors started about him and angelina so it's very relevant to my sort of analysis of Achilles' masculinity and sexuality because it kind of plays into this whole him as this uh, playboy figure, you know, seducing women, getting all these beautiful women. And that really then people are going to be with their minds going into them, watch Brad Pitt play Achilles. And they're going to have this in the back of their mind because I don't think you can watch him in Troy and not think that's Brad Pitt. You don't watch and go, Achilles, you think that's Brad Pitt. Yeah, I mean, it was like the height of his career and for him to play that mm. role. Um, yeah, to bring it back to the Patroclus, because I, I've never yes. like registered how he's presented to Odysseus. That's fascinating. I need to rewatch this, not least because 
I love Odysseus and Sean Bean as Odysseus, I should say. I like to interchange the two. They're basically the same person. Um, (laughs) But yeah, the Patroclus of it all is also so interesting because of how they frame him. Mm -hmm. So like I know there there are arguments to be made that technically Patroclus can be seen as Achilles' cousin in the mythology. I don't think that takes away from the fact that they were in a relationship. Like I, you know, it's Greek mythology. Everyone's related. Persephone's uncle or Hades is Persephone's uncle on both sides is the thing I like to remind everyone I didn't realize it was that bad Mm -hmm. yep (laughs) like literally he's their uncle mother and father great times um but so you know it doesn't matter that they were cousins but in Troy Mm -hmm. the cousin is like emphasized so much and I've always taken that as that really strong like we're not gay he's my cousin he's also like considerably younger he's very like yeah that whole vibe and then positioning Brad Pitt the two women thing I've never thought of it in that way of like just being like we're starting out with a bang this man is straight you guys (laughs) exactly it is because it is the first time we see him and then yeah Patroclus is his younger cousin and Again, like you said, um, and as lots of people, when I posted about, you know, were they cousins or not on Twitter, people were very quick to say, does it even matter? And I'm like, no, I'm not saying it actually mattered for ancient people, but I'm saying that in Troy, it's not actually quite right. And it now means that a lot of people now think that's what their relationship was. Like I was at dinner with friends last night and I mentioned I was going to do this podcast and talk about their relationship. And one person immediately went, oh, well, they were cousins. And I was like, oh my God, it's happening. (laughs) Um, So I had to then kind of explain it varies according to the different genealogies, but it's only in Hesiod's Theogony that we have this, like the genealogy has them as first cousins. Usually they're sort of distant, which again, though, doesn't actually matter for an ancient, you know, Zeus and Hera, like no one really (laughs) cared back then, but it's used in, it's clearly appealing to like modern tastes and sensibilities to be like, this is another preventative measure to sort of add this barrier between um, them and a homoerotic reading. And yeah, and then the multiple women, the younger, having him younger as well is really interesting because in all mythological sort, he's older. He's the older of the two. It's explicitly stated in the Iliad and later sources, which um, then causes a whole load of issues for uh, later Greek writers, which I don't know whether to get into that now or... (laughs) I mean, I've not mentioned that enough on the show because I don't know enough about it. Like, I know basically that the the great like argument that that a lot of people, a lot of people who, you know, with deep knowledge of of ancient sources, will say anytime the internet starts debating about whether or not they were lovers is like, you know, the ancient Greeks didn't care whether whether they were lovers or not. They only cared who was the top and who was the bottom, and like that yeah. was their great debate. I managed to keep what I was going to say, which so rarely happens when I have these issues, but yeah, it's, it's so interesting too, because that kind of comes down. It comes back to like one of my favorite things to talk about when it comes to the ancient world and I won't harp on it, but like the, the sort of the, the way everything changed over so many generations, like, because I think, you know, people on the outside tend to forget just how many centuries are involved when it comes to talking about ancient Greece. And this is a great example of it because their relationship is this like Homeric tradition. So, you know, it's the like oldest sources that we have. It's this like very old tradition of oral storytelling. And then it's these later people, I imagine probably in Athens because they almost always were like yeah. trying to understand this Erastes Romanos relationship, but like it didn't probably, it didn't apply in the Homeric tradition in which this was written. And so it's like, they can't wrap their heads around who was who because there wasn't a who was who back then. Exactly. The So the Erastes Aromanes, uh, Aromanus dynamic, it's kind of traced back to sort of the seventh century BCE uh, to Crete, I think is where they think it originated. But Homer is putting pen to paper, so to speak, in sort of the eighth, eighth century, um, 
it's it's yeah there's probably about a 50 to 100 year sort of difference and it just so yeah it just didn't exist in homer's time so there it's completely beyond their understanding yeah and then it's probably like just trying to wrap their heads around it but it's like it's just yeah it's so interesting i didn't know it came from crete too or that it was that old that's fascinating too because i was kind of hmm. i mean i guess i associate it with the whole of the greek world but i always think about it in terms of athens because you know we that's what most of our sources are from and everything but yeah, yeah. that's that's interesting but um th- it's the thing though with homer is the way he talks about their relationship it it's been sort of viewed as filling um fitting in with this epic tradition that already existed especially in middle eastern texts so uh this very intense male friendship we find in like the epic of gilgamesh for instance or um even the book of samuel in the old testament the relationship between david and jonathan is that very intense male friendship and that's kind of people have said that's perhaps more an applicable comparison than the pederastic relationships we have later yeah yeah that i'm only familiar with the epic of gilgamesh but it does they absolutely fit that kind of thing where it's like i think now we can kind of see it as like yeah they were super close and like i mean whether they were officially lovers or whatever like they were probably having sex regardless they were just like you know because it just i mean it it seems to me that they certainly were in the iliad but i know it's not explicit um but yeah. it's it, it comes back to our the way we have to like understand these things now too right like i i have this new kind of theory only in my head that i have not even looked into i'm sure it's talked about a lot but i just love the idea that like there were probably a lot of women that were having sex with each other but like nobody saw it as sex because sex in the ancient greek world was penetrative and so it's like they just didn't care probably. And they just didn't think about whether women were fucking all the time. And I just like to imagine that like women had this kind of extra level of freedom with each other because it just wasn't seen as anything. So there is some, I can't remember the the exact term, but there was, um, so remember we mentioned the whole like active, passive, like, you know, who who's topping who basically and how that was important. There's a term for women who took on the penetrative role and it was like tria triabes triabides or something like that I, I don't i've only got one year of beginners greek and this is obviously a more obscure term but there were terms for women being the penetrator in the dominant role which is um indicates this obviously happened but because of the sources we get being predominantly male they're not really interested in women and they had that whole idea of you know the male male relationship being this pure honorable thing yeah yeah, because it was like a tradition, the male male relationship. Like the, it was like you. This is a thing that you did, and then you got older. Like when you were young, you had an older man, and then when you got older, you took on a younger man. It's just like, like an actual, an actual thing that was sort of practiced. It's dark and fascinating, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's by our standards horrifying, but it was just a part of their sort of elite culture. It part of the coming of age was it was not always sexual as well it was this but it was that idea of a mentorship like a boy being put with an older mentor and then that relationship would be a very good social connection for later on in life and you would after the relationship as um in its pederastic form ended you would still have that very close political connection so there's a lot of political and military sort of aspects to it as well that's interesting because even the way you phrased it, it sounds so much like what they try to emphasize in Troy when it comes to those two, just without the fact that it did often have a sexual connotation because like mm-hmm. it, like the way it's presented could very well be seen as pederasty without the sex. Like, cause Brad Pitt is clearly older. He's meant, I'm not even going to call him Achilles. This is exactly what you're talking about. It's the way that he is like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He's Brad Pitt. Um, like he's clearly older he's this mentor he he has all this like this type of relationship with patroclus but then they're so explicitly like no but we're not having sex we're very related in the like modern sensibilities of being related yeah no exactly right it's that um you have that teacher student relationship but in pederastic terms and especially considering the massive age difference between them it does still very much work so it's they were trying to obviously be like, no, he's like, you know, he's a father figure. He's uh, teaching him, you know, it's like, well, OK, but that by ancient standards, that still works. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, that's so interesting. So, 
Okay. I, like, as much as I feel like I could talk about Troy forever because I was like 16 when it came out and it was so formative in my love of ancient Greece. <laughs> Um, like <laughs> we'll talk about them, you know, beyond this. But so my other big frame of reference, we've already mentioned it, is the song of Achilles. Like I have read that. I do love it. I and I take your point about everything too. I've never I like I I read it so long ago before I kind of had the knowledge of history that I do now. And so it's it is interesting mm-hmm. to see like it does kind of gloss over all the more, you know, the issues surrounding all all of that kind of tradition. Like, what other kind of uh, pieces of reception are you finding with them? And, like, how are they treated? So, for me, specifically, I'm looking at the 21st century and popular culture. So, um, each of my chapters in my thesis is a different medium. So, I have film, which is Troy, uh, TV, which is the TV show Troy Fall of a City, which um, I could talk about for hours. I have so many thoughts on. Uh, the novel, so Song of Achilles, I've... I've not reread it recently. It's been a few years, but I'm about to reread it because this is going to be my next chapter. And then I'm going to do video games. So Hades and the relationship, because I'm very interested in the fan aspects. So not so, and same with Song of Achilles. It's like, it's not just these works themselves, but I'm also then going to look at fan art and fanfic where applicable. Um, And I'm also trying to incorporate memes into it. So like the memes that exist about Troy. And there are a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's how I kind of, I think, got to know you and uh, Ben was my call for memes, begging people to send me, send me memes. I can only imagine how many you would have gotten, like, once you had Ben kind of working with you on that. I was honestly, I was just in the pub after I run a seminar series and I was just in the pub afterwards after doing this. And I was, you know, I've not, I've only got maybe if not even 200 followers um, and at that point, I didn't even have a hundred. And I'm just like, I had notifications on my phone for Twitter because I didn't have many people responding, so it didn't matter. And I'm suddenly noticing my phone is blowing up, and I'm like, what is going on? And I look, and I saw it was because he had replied, and people were absolutely going wild and really engaging. And I was like, oh, this is a lot more than <laughs> than I had hoped for. Yeah, I mean, his audience is really like active broadly but when it comes to that couple like I can I can only imagine because <laughs> the memes are so good is they're so especially about Troy um and one thing I'm interested in is because unfortunately with memes you can't pinpoint when they originated and their context necessarily unless it's one that's you know Ben has just made recently and then we can look at and be like oh okay yeah context I know now but a lot of these, I'm like, especially mocking the cousins dynamic in Troy or that it's not, you know, two and a half stars, not gay enough. I'm interested in the, so the memes, how much of it is sort of more general and how much of it is influenced by people who have then read Song of Achilles and now are going back to Troy and getting outraged. Because again, Troy was how most people got their knowledge of Achilles and Patroclus' relationship. And then Song of Achilles came along, which was another kind of simple sort of reception so instead of just being their cousins no no homo to they're lovers and they are boyfriends and they love each other and it's very clear cut as well and we kind of move from one to the other yeah I can see how much I mean I just from my position where I'm at like the way Song of Achilles influences my listeners broadly and even me Mm -hmm. like I, I am I do have my own like deep obsessions with the ancient sources. So I always try to like talk about reception, but then also talk about it in relation to what we know of from the ancient world. But yeah, I mean the, the way that my listeners are constantly seeking Achilles and Patroclus like content and, and content that is so specific to their relationship. It's why I know that they're going to love this episode and it's why I'm going to air it during pride. And it's like, you know, all, all these different things, like they, they are such a kind of, it's almost like, yeah, the, the sort of fandom around them as a couple it is, I would say, considerably more interesting than them in the ancient texts. Yeah, because the ancient texts, um, I do find them really interesting. But if you want to find evidence for their relationship in Homer, it's not you're not going to be satisfied if you've come from Song of Achilles. So, in the Iliad, it is not you. I think you can interpret them as lovers, but I know people who very strongly disagree with that interpretation, which I think is fair enough. It's it's not clear cut. Um, so then 
while I say they were never cousins in the Iliad, they were also never explicitly lovers. It was a hyteros, again, sorry for my butchering of ancient Greek, which is a companion or comrade in like a military sense. That's how they're described. Or there's another word used, which means like attendant or comrade, again, meaning lower rank, usually to describe Patroclus. So, and but there is stuff you can read. So there's actually a tangent. Um, one of my bits that I like is there's, um, I think it's book nine, Phoenix tells this story of Meliaga. I think that's how you say that it again. Greek is not my forte. And uh, it's basically he is identifying Achilles with this great uh, legendary mythological figure of Meliaga. And uh, the whole story is that Meliaga withdrew from battle and they everyone needed him to return to battle, uh, which is obviously very much what Achilles is doing. And then Meliaga's wife comes to him crying and begs him, please come back to battle go back to fighting and he does and that's going to be really echoed later when Patroclus crying goes to Achilles and beseeches him to return to battle and that so you clearly have these moments where like Patroclus is fulfilling or sort of is portrayed as this wifely figure also just the general stuff where um the uh the ambassadors come to um Achilles's tent and it's kind of the equivalent of when, you know, someone comes over and the the man would go to the wife and be like, oh, come on, let's put the kettle on. We've got guests on. And effectively, that's what Achilles does with Patroclus. Uh, And he has him pouring the wine and providing the food, which is what a wife would have done. So you can definitely read it that way. And then the way Achilles reacts to Patroclus' death is exactly the way he mourns Patroclus' death is he's tearing at his hair, he's covering himself in ash, he's beating his breast, which is exactly how a woman was expected to um, uh, to mourn. Yeah, I love the the really specific, like it, it is such kind of clear evidence while being not clear. I didn't know the connection to that Melly Eger story though. That's interesting. And like, I was just thinking about that name in relation to Atalanta, but I think that there are two and I was trying to kind of I I think it might be the Atalanta one I'm not my Greek mythology is um a bit shabby because I've been so focused on reception I haven't looked so much at mythology when it's not explicitly engaging with something I'm looking at well it's funny because this is in relation to Jennifer Saint's new novel Atalanta uh which is so it's like I was thinking about a relation to reception but I do think they're two different men of the same name which of course happens but I think that that is the case in this one if I recall but regardless I love that connection I didn't realize that there was that kind of it like explicit to an extent you know a- idea of like him actually playing this role that has earlier been played by a wife that's great and the yeah the put the kettle on idea like he does he they are very um domestic together like they are Incredibly. very yeah they're very like comfortable and just like their relationship is so interesting because, yeah, like you said, it's not explicit. Like, you cannot read the Iliad and find reference to them definitely being in any kind of romantic relationship. But at the same time, you can read all of these bits and pieces. And then, of course, yes, with with the death of Patroclus, where he really does take on this, like, pretty explicit feminine role in terms of how you handle the death of of like your husband or loved one like that is really fascinating but yeah so like all these different bits and pieces that when you put them all together and you kind of want to see that romance like they're there but then you can also put them all together and like explicitly be like but they're still not romantic yeah you can still then pull the whole well it's not explicitly stated i'm not convinced but I mean, he, again, with the way he mourns Patroclus, there's a bit, I think, where he cradles Patroclus's head. And that exact um, action is repeated by Andromache with Hector. She's cradling the head in the similar way. It is, I personally am convinced that there is some, it's more than just friendship. But again, perhaps that's my modern sensibility because for us, it's very difficult to understand this idea of such an intense male platonic, not in the playful sense, but, you know, non-sexual, non-romantic relationship. It just doesn't, we can't compute, but then, okay, so another tangent, there's a really interesting text called um, Achilles in Vietnam. And it's about, um, it's by Jonathan Shea, I think. And he talks about um, 
PTSD in soldiers from the Vietnam War and he's sort of pushing for kind of maybe a classical, I might be butchering this entirely, um, kind of classical approach to mourning, this public mourning and how he thinks that would be very good, healthy for these soldiers. With that and these other um, texts that look at Vietnam War vets, um, the way that they experience male friendship and like comradeship is so intense. Um, I read interviews from my masters um, from Vietnam War vets, and they talk about how if something had happened to one of their friends, they would drop everything, their wife, their kids drop it, and they would go help this friend because, and it was not sexual, not romantic, but it was this intensity that no one who hadn't experienced it would ever understand. So we do have these kind of more sort of modern relationships like that. So it does exist, but for the majority of us who have never experienced that, it we cannot understand that kind of friendship. So I think myself included, and because I loved Song of Achilles so much, read it when I was 17, and it definitely... For, it influences my and I think others responses to the the ancient texts themselves yeah yeah it, I mean it's so hard we can't like anyone kind of looking back on this stuff like it's basically impossible to separate yourself completely like you know you can do your best and talk around it kind of like we are but yeah I mean we still exist in our current world and and so I like to kind of phrase it like you know what we would now call a relationship a gay relationship or or like you know when it, i talked to a lot about um trans people in in greek myth and it's like you know we can't say that they were trans back then but we the type of person and their experiences we would now refer to as trans and so you know like there's there's all these different ways and it it it, it does adds i think so much to look at them in all like in whatever kind of you know, like holistic kind of way that you can of sort of acknowledging all these different sort of possibilities, like what you're saying with the PTSD of it all, while also just being like, yeah, but you know, I see them as gay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, I completely agree. Um, I ha I don't like how sometimes in academia, you're meant to have this distance and take on this very um, objective voice. And I just think it's not possible. Like, your experiences are going to completely shape how you approach and understand these sources. Yeah. And I think it's, I think that's, what's interesting. That's why I like doing reception because it, it adds something new to the ancient material. It becomes this two way uh, dialogue and relationship where the ancient source obviously influences the later reception, but then you look back at the late, uh, the original source and you are influenced by the, the modern work, it's the same with the World War poems, where it's, um it is sweet to die for one's country or something is one of those famous quotes. And that was a direct quote from, I want to say Ovid, but I probably got that wrong. Um, and obviously at the time that would have been read unironically, but now after this World War One poem, where it is definitely ironic and making fun of this idea, and pointing out that it is not true and it's horrible, you then can't help but look at the ancient poem now and think, oh, maybe maybe the original poet was actually being ironic. Maybe this was, we, we, we took it at face value, but maybe that's not actually the case. And I think that happens then with like Achilles and Patroclus. We can look at it and think differently about their relationship, which, yeah, I think is very interesting. I also think, uh, uh, particularly when it comes to relationships like these, and, and and the same applies for, like I was mentioning, like trans characters as well, like, it's also important to look at it from our modern lens and, like, use it as a kind of reminder to people, like, that, you know, loving relationships between men can and did exist in the ancient world, whether or not it's explicit or whether or not they've been interpreted that way in the like no 2700 years since like it's helpful I think for modern people to understand that like so many of these things are not new and not fresh and like you know it's not like something that cropped up in the last however long it's like it's just we we see these things differently um but w what you're saying too about like the the like you know whether ancient sources were being ironic or not like I think about that a lot 
in relationship to kind of any of the sources, like, because we do so often have to go on face value. And I think a lot in return in when it comes to Euripides, because I love him and like, I just always want to see the best in him, but I'm, I'm currently writing a series on arrest, the Orestes. And like, there's all these moments. Yes. Such a good play. It's wild. Um, and there's all these moments where like, if you read it at face value, like Euripides is like, he's really shitting on women kind of in explicit words. But if you kind of really look at sort of what's going on and him as a whole, you can read the irony that is in there. And, but it's like, you can't, you know, be certain either way. And you kind of have to sort of make these guesses based on the rest of the writing and sort of what was going on and who knows. And like, it's all up for interpretation. We'll never know for certain anything about the ancient world. And that's what makes it so fun. <laughs> exactly. I, I kind of like that. We'll never know for sure. So it's up to us to make these interpretations. Um, as long as we're aware that, you know, what we say isn't gospel truth, then I think it's fine. I, it's it's enjoyable. But when you mentioned the Oresteia, that really made me think of another point of comparison for Achilles and Patroclus, which is the relationship between Orestes and Pilates. Pilates? Oh, how do you say it? I say Pilates, but it's probably Pilates or it could be either one. Yeah, the, it's the Canadian v yeah. <laughs> English. Exactly. Um, but so a lot of um, analysis of Achilles and Patroclus' relationship has been put as not only into this... Um, the context of the epic friendship like uh, Gilgamesh and uh, the Bible, but also Greek mythology more generally has these intense male friendships like Orestes and Pylades. So that's like another sort of context as well um, where you could argue that Achilles and Patroclus and the Iliad are just sort of within this trope of mythology. So I guess that's another point against perhaps a queer reading, but also we're now looking at Orestes and Pylades and it's very much being reclaimed by um, queer folk. Like the whole, uh, the translation where it's like, it's rotten work, not if, not for me, not if it's you. That's spoken to a lot of the LGBT community. So hmm. again, it kind of works both ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just using that example too. I'm trying to think of like other other close male friendships in Greek myth, like there, Heracles has a couple for sure. Yeah. And then there are, of course, like a number of more, more explicit, like romantic relationships between gods and mortals, but they always end in death. But like, I think Heracles and, and like Hylas is one, though it ends in death. And then he mm -hmm. has his other, you know, quote unquote, good, good friend as academics like to say um and then yeah and then Orestes and Pilates but I feel like there's not a ton otherwise there are kind of these like really specific ones that really stand out so there's um Damon and Pythias is another which is like meant hmm. to illustrate like the benefits of a Pythagorean um approach to life so it's the whole being willing to sort of face danger and death for each other is the idea um and then there's this like historical couple that's also been sort of cited, like Harmodius and Aristogaton, I think. There's like some other precursors. And then later we have, um, so this is obviously more of a reception of the Iliad versus a comparative uh, myth, but uh, the Nisus and Euryalus uh, relationship uh, in the Aeneid. And I am obsessed. I literally, I have a tattoo of the statue of them from the Louvre. And that's very much, I would argue, meant to replicate the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus. And I think more so in the Aeneid, it's quite clearly, in my mind, a romantic relationship. But it uses a lot of the same sort of wording that we get from the Iliad. So the idea of them being dear companions, most beloved uh, companion is how Patroclus is described uh, in the Iliad. And then you get similar sort of wording in the Aeneid, this, um, you know, they were most beloved to each other, most dear to each other. It definitely kind of, and one's older, one's younger, which kind of has that pederastic element, which um, was discussed so much in ancient responses to uh, the Iliad. So, yeah. I was just going to bring them up because I remember you mentioned it when we were first talking about, about chatting and because like, I notoriously don't care for Roman sources all of that much, uh, particularly the Aeneid, except as no. fan fiction. I like I like it as fan fiction. I like to 
I like to <laughs> entertain it and like look at it as I like. I, okay, I'm gonna talk around everything I just said. I do enjoy. I love Ovid. I love Ovid. Metamorphoses and Heroides specifically, but Ovid broadly. And I do like the Aeneid for very specific reasons in that it is interesting to look at, like I said, kind of as fan fiction, but also I like because so little in terms of Greek mythology explicitly can be seen as having been like written with an explicit intention in mind. Like there's so little of that. There's the tragedy for sure, but then there's like all these other elements about why they were writing tragedy that it doesn't totally fit in the same way. So what I like about Ovid and the Aeneid is looking at it as something that was written for a purpose like we would write things now like writing down a story writing down a novel an epic poem versus like oral storytelling that eventually gets put for us to keep today um and I do like it like I read through it and I was just like wow yeah like the, the level of fan fiction and I know there's a lot of debate about that but it is interesting to read as fan fiction but that was all to very not eloquently say I do not know much about the Aeneid beyond I did episodes on it ages ago now it was at the beginning of the pandemic I started it before the pandemic and then immediately realized what a horrible mistake it was when we all went into lockdown and like the world was considerably more depressing and I was like trying to slog through Aeneas because I just think Aeneas uh, someone described him I think in an episode with me as like a blank slate and I think that's incredibly true. Like he just kind of takes on whatever kind of heroic moment is being imitated at any given time, almost from the Iliad and the Odyssey. And anyway, that's all to say, I would love to hear any of your thoughts about the Aeneid, but also specifically about Nessus and Euryalus because they are interesting. And so, oh, I think what you're saying is really interesting. I do, I kind of do agree with the whole fan cast. I love the Aeneid and um, my hot take is it's my favourite of the ancient epics, like the classical ones. I literally Ooh. look, I literally have it tattooed, the opening line, Armour from Kano. <laughs> so I love it. Um, but I, I think it also holds a special place. It's the kind of text I read at school that made me want to move beyond sort of GCSEs, which is when you're like exams when you're 15, 16 it made me want to go beyond and continue doing classics. So it has a very special place in my heart and I think it's very enjoyable, but it is absolutely, I, I like that description of Aeneas as a blank slate. Like, I think that's absolutely right. I just really enjoy, I think the other characters are what I enjoy in the Aeneid and especially Nisus and Euryalus. I just, I love the way their relationships portrayed. It's so playful early on. There's this um, at Anchises funeral games there's a whole uh, foot race scene where um, oh, I'm trying to, Nisus, I believe, is the older, Euryalus is the younger. And uh, Nisus is winning the foot race, but he falls. And then there's a guy in second place, and then there's Euryalus in third. So Nisus falls, and he's like, oh, well, I've lost. So he then trips up the guy who's in second place so that Euryalus can then win. And then there's like a whole thing after the race where the guy who should have won after uh, Nisus is like, hang on, they cheated. Like, that's not fair. So Aeneas has to come along and be like, no, 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 you all get a prize now. <laughs> um, stuff like that. And then their death, I find um, quite heart heartbreaking because it's just, Nis uh, Euryalus is clearly this young kind of immature. They've, I mean, they've just committed some absolute atrocities on a um, uh, enemy camp nearby. But it's the fact Euryalus, he's weighed down by all the armor and spoils he's wearing and the, it catches in the moonlight so that the enemy then see them and spot where they are so they can chase and then they have to run through the woods um, to escape and Nisus is running ahead, he's running ahead, he, uh, he's looking behind, it's all good um, and then he gets into a clearing after a while and he stops, he can breathe, looks Euryalus is nowhere to be seen so he immediately he's like, oh shit goes running back and he finds Euryalus because he's been wearing all these spoils and armor, being this young, foolish um, person, he has been caught by the enemy. And so Nisus arrives, he tries to, you know, fight off some of them, but he's too late. Euryalus is killed in front of him. And then he goes on a bit of a murder rampage trying to kill other people. And eventually he is killed himself. And it's described how he falls on top of uh, Euryalus's body. And that's what the statue in the Louvre is of. And so that's what I have um, tattooed because uh, I thought it was just a beautiful, very sad scene. 
And yeah, and then the line Virgil writes, which is, if my words have any power, memory shall never erase, uh, time shall never erase you from memory, which I think is a really beautiful quote. back to the actual yeah. text it is just a beautiful scene I think I think it is absolutely gorgeous and it really struck me um and it's probably worth adding the context I think the reason why that and Song of Achilles were such formative texts for me is it was a time when I was coming to terms with my own sexuality so to see it is that seeing something of yourself this um this historic element to it it it, it gets you yeah, and that's, I mean, that's why I, I always make a point of talking about these relationships when they exist in mythology. And like I was saying earlier, like, you know, a- as much as these are sort of modern interpretations based on ancient things, like, I think it's important to use modern words, too, to, like, to call Achilles and Patroclus gay and, like, you know, to to explain the context around where that where that is coming from in terms of what we do and do not know from the ancient world but to still say it and and talk about these relationships for for what we can like pretty clearly say that they are regardless of you know what what the ancient sources did and did not tell us um because yeah i think like it it is really beneficial to people who are figuring out their own sexualities figuring out themselves broadly and like wanting to see that both in like the world around them generally but also in the ancient world is so it's such a different thing because it is so like based in kind of how especially in the west like how we see ourselves as humans is so directly tied to ancient greece and rome and and so often has these like more problematic connotations that people want to emphasize this like they were the smartest they were the most creative they invented everything they were super straight in a lot of like these interpretations whereas seeing sort of the truth about it both the the problematic stuff and things like they were not super straight they had they were not you know they and then you can go too far into the other side which you were saying earlier this idea that they were like really accepting and it's like that's not true either but they did at least recognize that like people could love uh, and did love people of the same sex you know yeah I think my impulse with Achilles and Patroclus is if I had to put any label to that modern label to them it would be bisexual or pansexual dependent because I know people have different definitions um but because they do have relationships with women in the ancient sources but also I would say especially the later so as I've said in Iliad, you can definitely read it that way. But there's later sources where it is very explicit, like Aeschylus's Myrmidons. We only have fragments of this play, but there's a, a passage um, or fragment, it's t- a couple lines, where Achilles is um, saying to the corpse of Patroclus, you've shown no reverence for the holiness of your thighs, which for us were like, but it was so clearly a reference to intercrural sex which um, I don't know if I need to maybe describe that for your <laughs> listeners. <laughs> so um, as mentioned, uh, there were very strict social rules for pederastic relationships. And um, because it was this part of this um, sort of coming of uh, age uh, social ritual, it, these young boys, the Eurominus, would later become the ruling elite um, of the whichever Greek city state they're in. And so if they were to have been penetrated, that would be problematic because then that would put them on the level of like prostitutes and slaves. And so they couldn't have that. So they had to kind of come up with these alternative forms of sex that would be social, would be acceptable. And one of them was intercruel, which is where the Orastes would, um, he would, he would fuck the, (laughs) the boy's thighs um so intercrural between the thighs and then the boy was not meant to show um a great deal of pleasure he was not meant to take too much to enjoy it too much because 
that would again be he's enjoying the passive feminine role which again is not not great for the future you know politicians and leaders um so this comment about you know the holiness of patroclus's thighs is very clearly re- referencing that and then it means that in Aeschylus's mind Achilles was the Erastes, the older uh, dominant one, and Patroclus was the Aromanus, the passive partner. I did not know that. That is fascinating and wild. And the Greeks were so weird. <laughs> like <It's> so weird. <laughs> like just bending over backwards to keep these like just nonsensical things in check. Oh, that's amazing. I did not know that line from the Myrmidons either. I love fragmentary text and like the, the weird things that we do and do not know from them. I'm just still taking that in. That's wonderful. It's great. And then there's um Plato uh, symposium. He has the speaker Phaedrus then say that um, Aeschylus was wrong in saying this and that clearly uh, Patroclus was the Orestes because he was older and wiser and Achilles was more beautiful and younger. So we see this direct engagement with older texts and disagreements. Um, although Aeschylus is writing what, like fifth century and Plato's in the fourth. So it's about maybe up to a hundred years between them, but it's interesting. And then we have people like Xenophon who are like, absolutely not. That, that was not a pederastic relationship at all. You're all wrong. I didn't know Xenophon felt that strongly about that. That's interesting too. Like, I love the idea. I mean, these are the things I love about ancient sources broadly, but yeah, like looking at like their own reception of their own texts, because we have this like enormous time frame to work with. Then we get things like that. We're like, yeah, Aeschylus is writing in, in like, yeah, you know, fifth century. And then Plato comes around later and he's got his own ideas. And then Xenophon's around the same time and he's got his own ideas. And like, everyone's just got all these different things to say. And we kind of just have to like figure it all out. And then of course they're all talking about a text that's like two to three, maybe 400 years older than Aeschylus even. And, and he's one of our older sources and it's just like, God, there's so many things happening and it's fascinating. And then, I mean, you know, toss in something like the Aeneid, which is so directly working off of Homeric texts, but is so much later and in a whole other world. And like, I mean, I like the ancient sources, if that's not clear, like as if it's not my entire life. <laughs> yeah i love it because also all of these ancient sources they're all working for their own agenda as well so like um i I read somewhere that aeschylus um in tragedy it's that tragic eros that tragic love and so that's perhaps why he goes down this perhaps more explicit route because it fits the genre and then plato well he's doing his own thing symposium that would be a whole podcast i think series and then you have later this guy Aeschylus. Again, I've probably butchered that. And he uses them Achilles and Patroclus as an example of good, a uh, good homosexual relationship, uh, following the societal rules. It's pure. It's uh, good love. And he's because he's using it as an example of good love versus um, this political rival of his, Timarchus, who he's being like you. The way you conduct yourself is inappropriate. You are. You are taking on this passive role. You're being penetrated. That's inappropriate. You should not be in public life versus these great, um, you know, ideals of homosexual love. So it it really varies not only through time, but also what agenda they have with their writing. And again, that carries through, I mean, to today as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, and, and yeah, <laughs> it makes me think. So I was also recently covering... Aristophanes is Thesmoria Thesmophoria Zusai. And he's got all these, like, he's got two different characters in there who are both, you know, I think we could term them gay or or and I also did want to mention when you said this earlier too, but you're quite right. Like obviously Achilles and Patroclus would be termed more like bisexual or pansexual. Mm. Um, not least because of all the enslaved women that are involved. Uh, but yeah, like Aristophanes has these characters who who are both like the they're both clearly in relationships with men or, you know, have had relationships with men, but they are both being sort of made fun of in this play because they have taken on the passive role. They're basically women. He calls them like they dress like women, all these different things. Like it really does emphasize 
the way that like for all the Greeks had these like ideals that we can see as being kind of progressive in our eyes. They also had the exact opposite in spades. Like they, it's just sort of, you know, it, it, everything was just different. Like it's all the same bullshit that we have today. It was just different. Yeah, exactly. Right. I, okay. Um, okay. There's, there's so much to say about this couple, but I'd love to hear more about like, Oh, I, I mentioned (laughs) this is ADHD. Um, (laughs) So you mentioned Hades too, and and then oh, and Troy Fall of a City. I would love to hear more about Troy Fall of a City and Hades, but both of them are things that my listeners more so Hades, who like everyone and their dog wants me to play Hades, and I'm sorry to say again, I have not, um, because I just don't really play video games that aren't Assassin's Creed wow. Odyssey, um, and Achilles is in that, but it's the best. Oh my god, uh, but Patroclus is not in that. That's fine, uh, but. Like the Troy Fall of a City, I remember when it started, I watched the first episode and I just, for me, (laughs) it was like so British that it just took me right out and I never kept watching. And I don't really remember anything more than thinking like, it's really, it's really British, Uh, but I'm curious about how they handle it and like what you think about it and everything. So, um, Troy Fall of a City, I find interesting. So I didn't watch it when it came out. I only watched it when I was writing my master's dissertation because I knew there was this threesome between Achilles, Patroclus and Briseis, which is one of my favorite things to analyze. And so I actually got to meet the executive producer and talk to him about this because I was like, I wish I could just find out what was going on in their minds about some things. So some stuff I can't, I got told some stuff in confidence, but I think that I can probably talk about. But um, Amazing. It was great. But I think Troy Fall of a City is, it had a lot of potential. And I think it does some things really well. Um, It really finds itself at the end in the last few episodes. And I'm disappointed. I was hoping for a second season, perhaps following Odysseus. But alas, not to be, because the show, I mean, the show was absolutely review bombed. And it's because they cast a black man as Achilles. And that's something I talk about a lot, the impact of race on the reception of his masculinity and sexuality, because um, I think it's very naive to think that didn't play a role in how people perceive the character. I mean, so I looked at IMDb reviews and apologies in advance to listeners because some of these reviews aren't very nice. But uh, one reviewer called Achilles the average uh, angry black dude. And I'm like, sir, have you read the Iliad or any other, like seen any other reception? Anger is literally the first word of the Greek text. That's the driving force of everything. But because it was a black man playing um, Achilles, it becomes, it became this uh, marker of race, um, which was just awful. Um, But it really adds this extra element. And there's a lot of stuff in the show that's very uncomfortable in terms of masculinity and sexuality. So he assaults Helen at one point, which is an entirely new creation. And when you have this man making comments about like, oh, I could have filled in for your husband if he wasn't satisfying you and then assaulting her. It's playing into all, and it's, Helen is played by a light-skinned white actress. It's definitely playing into these ideas of black men as sexually dangerous, which is awful and really dangerous for not only black men, but wider communities. So I think there was, there were some issues, I think, in the show about that. But um the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus in that, I I would have liked to have been a bit more explicit because that is the way they were going. It feels at times perhaps they were a bit scared to take it that extra level. So we have this threesome between Achilles, Patroclus and Briseis in the fourth episode. So there's um, a scene where uh, so Patroclus is struck down by the plague of Apollo in Troy Fall of a City. And so we have Achilles looking after him, um, nursing him back to health. And I really like that scene because it really brings to mind this like famous um, Greek pottery, um, piece of pottery where it's um, it's a kilix, so a drinking vessel, and it's got Achilles bandaging a wounded Patroclus. And um, which is, wait, side note, um, which is very interesting for its portrayal of them because in that uh, kilix, you have clearly younger Achilles, beardless, and then a bearded Patroclus. So it, again, the way the, and the beard, the way the beard looks and the way uh, Achilles looks, it very much falls into pottery that depicts pederastic couples. So again, just bringing it back again, um, it, not only in literature do we see it, but we also see it in visual depictions of Achilles and Patroclus from ancient times. But yeah, so there's a scene where he's nursing him back to health. And it really, in my mind, I was like, oh, it's like that, you know, Killix. Um, and then what else? 
Oh, and so eventually he recovers from the plague because they return Chryseis to her father. And there's a scene where they're wrestling on the beach, which wrestling is obviously quite a homoerotic activity anyway. And then uh, Achilles manages to pin down Patroclus and then kisses him. And it's a really interesting shot. So I go very visual in my analysis. It's a really interesting shot of them. So throughout the show, we see Achilles and Patroclus in silhouette like an astounding number of times, like almost a bit problematic versus the white characters. Um, But we see them kiss in silhouette and then their faces, only their faces then blur as they kiss. And it's worth noting, we never see them kiss again outside of this scene. And when we do see them kiss in the scene, it is in silhouettes. And then with their faces blurred. And this is in comparison with the white pairings of the show. Even Odysseus gets a flashback uh, farewell scene with his um, wife, Penelope. And she's never seen again outside of this like less than a minute long scene. And they get a kiss not in silhouette with their faces blurred. And if I was being, you know, kind, I I think it could perhaps be meant to signify them kind of their, their merging into one person, perhaps which I think maybe is what they were intending to do, which is like the um, Aristophanes speech in uh, Plato's Symposium, that whole image of, you know, humans as being two halves of a whole and looking for your other half. And and that's been talked about in Song of Achilles. There's the famous line, uh, he is half of my soul, as the poets say. Oh. So, which is beautiful. So it is, I think it's meant to be that way, but then we never see them kiss again outside of this scene. And then Patroclus sort of shoves Achilles off and joins Briseis and she's all like, glad you didn't die uh, very eloquently and then kisses Patroclus Achilles joins and then all three kiss and it kind of ends with them all joining in silhouettes and blurring out of focus and then we never see the actual threesome itself and then Briseis is taken from them and Achilles doesn't actually seem that upset about it he's more the way he talked about it was like my girl got taken he never calls her by name afterwards it's my girl got taken you know he took my spoils stuff like that um, which sort of in my mind suggests she wasn't actually there was no romantic connection it was kind of more lust driven mm. and I remember I asked Derek Wax the producer I said what what why why did you do this threesome and he went oh um it was quite simply that they had read the Iliad and they had interpreted Achilles and Patroclus in particular as being sort of bisexual or sexually fluid was how he termed it and so they thought how best to reflect that threesome <laughs> interesting okay I now I feel like I do need to watch Troy Fall of a City. We'll see if I make that happen. Um, but like, okay, there's so many things happening there. Is Patroclus white? The actor? No, pa- uh, Patroclus is also played by a dark skinned black actor. Okay. Um, which was so when you read early reviews of the show, they're like, is this meant to be like their their cousins again? They're related or or what? But I'm like, just from a purely logistical point of view you need Patroclus to look similar to Achilles to be able to put on the... Because, you know, arms and legs are going to be on show. So um, logistically, you do need them to be the same race. So, yeah. But also in Troy Fall of City, they play into that again. uh, Achilles is the older of the two versus, again, the ancient sources where Patroclus is older. So it's not as big an age difference, I think, as in Troy between Achilles and Patroclus, but there's still that age difference. But they are... um, quite similar looking okay and i feel like it's interesting because that could also just be like they're saying they're from the same region like there's no reason to read it as relations yeah it's interesting that was where people's minds jumped but again i think people didn't quite know where troy of fall of a city was going to go with anything Mm mm-hmm it's so interesting like I mean I remember hearing about all the backlash towards Achilles being black which is just generally so sad it it Mm -hmm. reminds me I just saw today on Twitter for like a split second um an an older illustrator illustration somebody did of of Athena as black and just like people being mad again and it's just I mean I feel like this is such a tired argument but one that will never go away when it comes to the ancient world but this idea that everyone was fucking white is so bananas and it's just like do you know what the Mediterranean looked like do you know how big it was do you know how much they all like dealt with everyone all around the entire Mediterranean like where where do people get I mean I know where they get it because they just get it from like racism and western civilization as like a concept but like Mm. it's mind-boggling it's so interesting the origins of race again that's something i'm looking at in my thesis like where these ideas come from in visual culture and one thing i talk about is bodybuilding a lot 
Mm. So bodybuilders used classical imagery early on, like the founder, Eugen Sando, and he would cover himself in white powder and then mimic these poses of classical statues. Oh, it's great. Look, it's, you know, it's a guy from the 1800s, like pretty much nude apart from like a fig leaf. Um, mimicking these statues and that definitely plays into it and then bodybuilding used a lot of classical imagery and then the bodybuilders were then cast in these Italian peplum films in the 60s and 50s um, which again kind of plays on sort of white supremacist ideas like you know the ideal white man so there's so much going on in visual culture and the co-option of the ancient world by western uh, society modern western societies that when you then cast a dark-skinned black actor as Achilles, everyone loses their mind. It's like, okay, but you don't have an issue about, for instance, um, what is it? Uh, Brad Pitt, I guess, is a good example. Do you, you think this 40-year-old, blonde, blue-eyed American man is is a good fit? Like, but that's that. those inaccuracies are fine. It's... Mm. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think of the the one kind of memory I have of watching the first episode. And I think it was like, I, I remember watching The Judgment of Paris and I don't really remember anything else. I just remember thinking like they were also, for the most part, obviously not everybody, but like very white and very British. And it's like that has become the thing that signifies ancient Greece in terms of a lot of popular culture from Troy to um, to 300 to to. Troy Fall of the City, like, it is this idea that, like, beca- it's like they're because they're in Europe and they're speaking English, they should have British accents, which then means that they're very British. And, and you just kind of this, like, whiteness, as if enough whiteness hasn't already been, like, ascribed to the ancient world by modern Western society, like, as if there isn't enough, which is there's so much and there's the marble of it all and, you know, the lack of polychromy and But then you get this like movies and things and we get this additional white Western British ideals put on this like Greek world, which like, you know, it makes me think of modern Greece, which doesn't even get the kind of, you know, respect for lack of a better word that like more Western countries get in the modern world. Like modern Greece kind of gets this sort of like, different sort of subset like they don't even get to be the same part of the western civilization that has co-opted their history like they're often treated as lesser they're not on the same level as their ancient counterparts and it's like it's just so bizarre and weird and like i don't feel like i have enough knowledge to talk about it you know in any kind of depth but but this idea yeah that like achilles can't be black it is so wild and it's i mean not least because also the place where achilles comes from in the iliad is like deeply mythical like it i don't even i feel like it barely even has like a modern locale even in the way that like there's a lot of debate about whether the ithaca that odysseus is from is the ithaca that exists right like yeah Phidia, i think like isn't even like a, <laughs> it's not even like a place within many other myths it's like just achilles and and his family and yeah, it's just, it's so, I mean, it, it, I'll never understand it because the whole point of it is just like generally racism and, and white supremacy, but it is so wild to to really think about in this idea that like the rest of Troy Fall of a City that is super white is somehow more accurate than a black Achilles is like bananas. Like all I remember really was like really regional British accents that took me out where it was like, they weren't even all speaking it like, you know, the same kind of accent where I was like, I mean, it's, it's bad enough that they all have to be British, but then like, it was really regional where I was like, what is happening? Like it's, you know, we just really need, we need a movie with Greek people would be super chill. (laughs) It's honestly, the accent thing always kills me because you have um, like, so Patroclus is actually played by a South African actor. Oh, Um, better. And Paris is played by an Australian actor. <laughs> so, um, but they obviously that's become a default, I guess, is the British accent. And it is BBC, so I guess it makes some sense. Yeah. But it's like that in Troy too. Like, other than Brad Pitt, who doesn't really try, which I also find very funny, like <laughs> I think he's one of the few that isn't putting on a British accent in Troy for the, like, cause not all of them are British. Like a lot of the actors are, but I feel like Eric Bana might, I, it's been a while, but like, mm. yeah, I, I feel like if I recall thinking about it, Brad Pitt has got to be one of the few that isn't trying to sound very he's British. Got but maybe some that's not sort of accent. Yeah. He's I don't like, entirely he's... know what it's meant to be, but it's not his actual voice. Definitely. He's doing some sort of 
epic voice. I feel like he's trying to make it sound like he's from an older time and that's about it. Like it's not so much an accent as it is just like almost like an inflection based on being like, this is the ancient world. I'm still speaking English, but like I'm going to sound fancier or something. Yeah, he definitely spent more time with his uh, personal trainer than with a dialect coach. (laughs) Yeah, it's I mean, oh, God, that it's fascinating. I do. I do want to watch Troy Fall of a City now. Um, You should. I recommend (laughs) Yeah, I feel like I need to after all this time. But the idea, just to go back to what you were talking about too, and like the idea that we see somebody like Odysseus in a flashback kiss Penelope, Mm -hmm. whereas we don't fully see Achilles and Patroclus kiss is really interesting. And I think like has the obvious race connotation, like you were saying. And and I feel like even if they had this goal, like you were saying, like, you know, being kind, you can kind of see them have this, like the souls aspect. And it's like, sure. But it, 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 I feel like still when you're in this position, you're making this thing, you have to look at it and be like, okay, maybe we have this intention, but also maybe if we have two black actors playing these really important mythological figures and we make this choice that like, not only are they, you know, two men kissing, but two black men kissing and to not show it is like, no, you've made a horrible mistake, regardless of your original intentions. Like you've got to look at that and think like, this is going to look bad. Yeah. I just spoke at a conference um, about the sort of, especially the use of silhouette in the show and the impact of race. And one of the things I said is that ultimately it just serves as censorship of black queerness, which reflects, you know, mainstream attitudes Um, It also reflects racism uh, in queer communities and also homophobia in black communities in the UK and the USA. So on all these multiple levels, it's, it is just censorship and reflecting contemporary attitudes from mainstream and marginalized communities. Um, And again, I don't think they were going for it after speaking to Derek. He was genuinely love. He was really trying to do something good with this, but I think they just, they were trying to employ colorblind casting, which I'm a little skeptical about because I think they deliberately, cast black actors in these roles which i don't have an issue with at all i think it's a good thing to you know increase diversity on uh on tv but there was no consideration for how race would then impact people's responses to the characters and then when you include scenes like the assault of helen which does not have any precedent a black man assaulting a white woman or the threesome where it's two black men one white woman and i talk quite a bit about porn uh interracial pornography and um, it definitely, it doesn't present the most flattering portrayal of Achilles. And then we have this added level of his relationship with Patroclus is then not seen or shown. So in their sort of farewell scene, um, Patroclus is trying to get Achilles to fight. He's saying, fight with me, if not fight for me sort of thing. Um, and Achilles is like, look, um, you're pushing your luck, basically. Uh, you better stop before I forget that I once held any affection for you. And Patroclus says, it's not affection, it's love. And I'm not afraid of it. Um, so you're getting these declarations of love kind of thing. And throughout that farewell scene, uh, Achilles is like clasping Patroclus kind of on the cheek neck. And they've got very intense eye contact. And it's exactly like a scene in the 2004 Oliver Stone film, Alexander which famously was very uh, hesitant to depict the relationship between Alexander and Hephaestion explicitly. And there is a scene where they do the exact same thing, the declarations of love, cupping the cheek, eye contact. And it was quite frustrating to see this return to 2004 kind of attitudes. Like pre, I I always like to sort of frame it as pre-Brokeback Mountain, because that film kind of showed that you can get masculine, um, like queerness which disrupted all right we at that point it was just queerness um male homosexuality in particular was associated with campness and effeminacy and we were seeing this these traditionally masculine uh men who then were actually also queer um and i think after that it there's a shift then in media in representation mainstream media and it was quite it was it was yeah it was disappointing to see this return I would have liked to have seen it more explicitly depicted. Yeah. It's too recent of a show for it, for it to behave that way. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
Yeah, I think you have to. If I mean, it's good, absolutely. Like it's it's vital that when we have new representations of the ancient Mediterranean, specifically on screen, that we have more than white people. Like, I mean, I think even like they could have and probably should have done better, especially in terms of like people from Troy being like Lily White is ridiculous. They're like, Turkish. She's in Turkey. <laughs> yeah, it's in Turkey. I mean, give me a break. Like, and and not to mention like the the like ancient turkey too and like the influence that even further east and mm. south had on that whole region like come on i mean it's like when when shows and things depict like somebody like andromeda as white or like dido i feel i can't yeah. think of an example for dido but god's know like if she's depicted she's going to be white even though she's from carthage um but like yeah this it's good to do that but you have to also like be really aware of what you're doing and like Oh my, yeah, the idea that they also invented an assault of Helen yeah. after having cast a black actor as Achilles is like painful. I don't know what was going on with that scene. It's and it's so inconsistent with his later treatment of Briseis. He and in episode five, Odysseus is trying to get him to come back to fight him. He's like, "Give me, you know, uh, a reason one that isn't rape or pillage." And he talks about higher callings. And it's like, sir, you almost raped Helen in episode oh two or three two. It's and it's frustrating as well that with the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus, there is precedent to have depicted. So the TV show Spartacus, the stars show, had all kinds of sex scenes explicit. Um, so there is this precedent for TV shows to have depicted this, especially TV shows with ancient settings. And in fact, they're known for always having these boundary pushing portrayals of sex. So it's it suggests there was a last minute kind of fear of the repercussions thinking maybe this is too far now we're going to have to rein it in. That's completely hypothetical. Um, yeah. I um, It's, it's, yeah, it's just fundamentally I find disappointing because there's some other stuff in the show I find really where they don't shy away from stuff that I think's quite dark. So they have um spoiler alert for any no wait, I don't know if I should say it because you're gonna maybe. No, no, please, please spoil away. <laughs> so um the last episode they have the baby being thrown off the walls of Troy. They include that scene and I remember oh. watching it being like, there's no way. Like Odysseus is walking up the walls, uh the stairs with the bit and I'm like, there's no way and they do it. And I thought that was genuinely the best moment in the series because I went Oh, you went you went full mythological, like dark, and I, it was brilliant because I'd not seen something so dark before. Because it's you know it's murdering a baby. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I think so often too, like the um, I, I, Troy doesn't really do this, but they also like the thing that interests me so much in the Iliad is the way the Greeks are pretty objectively more villainous. Like, mm. you know, I think the Iliad is really interesting in that like it, it, it's being written kind of from a greek perspective but at the same time it's like very pro troy like they're very kind to the trojan characters like they seem to be really good people for the most part like other than the helen of it all but like you know we we appreciate them they're not villains they're sort of they're, at the very least both sides are kind of equal in terms of morality in the iliad and i think troy does that to an extent but they also don't villainize the greeks in the way that the iliad does like something like and not that not that that's in the Iliad, but like in the ancient sources, I should say broadly, because obviously like that the ending is not in the Iliad. But but like the way the ancient sources do make the Greeks look bad, like Odysseus throwing Astyanax off a wall, or like the the absolute complete destruction of Troy, and like these different things where the Greeks do look bad. Like a lot of shows don't do that, so it is I, I sort of now I realize I'm talking around in circles. But that's great that they that they do emphasize like the the absolute like horrific nature of some of the things that the Greeks do to the Trojans. Mm. Yeah, I think the show had. I think if it had got a second season, perhaps following Odysseus, because I think they were setting up the way it ends with a Odi- like close on Odysseus. I think they're really setting up to follow him in the Odyssey. And I think they had really sort of found their feet by the end. Uh, so I would have loved to have seen something mm-hmm. else. I mean, I just feel very fond of it. Even if, as I express my disappointment at some of the stuff, I find it such an interesting reception of the the ancient sources and the relationship of Achilles and Patroclus. It's given me a lot of fuel for my thesis. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think it's so like it's so important 
that we can appreciate things and also criticize them. So like, that's mm. awesome. Yeah. You can like a thing and then also be like, here's the things that that did wrong. Um, you mentioned earlier Star Spartacus. Well, actually, and an Od- like what I would not give for an Odyssey retelling on screen. That's good. Like I cannot express how, cause my uh, epic of love and the thing that like got me obsessed is the Odyssey. So like, I'm very biased towards Odysseus less so with the ass unix issue we don't throw babies off of walls i might not like children but like we don't put that far. Um, <laughs> yeah but that's going too far now. It's too far <laughs> but yeah i mean generally i want that but also i think star spartacus is a really good example not perfect but a good example of showing ac- the actual nature of like what people would have looked like in the ancient mediterranean due to the way everyone moved around and and worked together and things like it's still fairly white and it's very Australian and New Zealand, obviously, (laughs) but like they do make a real point of having more regional like ideas of of people. Usually they're enslaved, but it is Rome. So like we get it. Um, But yeah, it's interesting that something like Troy fall of a city could come after star Spartacus and still make so many of those, like you were saying, like kind of pre Brokeback Mountain ideas and use sort of those, those, what are now problematic things when it did, you know, come after a show like Spartacus, which is obviously not perfect, but like has a lot, it really did address, it addresses like the violence of the ancient world. Like it addresses the, the amount of assault that would have taken place, like enslavement broadly and, and like people of color just existing um if it's not clear i really like that show and and of course like i i obviously there's a huge part of it which is like the stars versus bbc of it all but it's still really interesting that like yeah that show came out in like 2012 and troy fall the city had to have been like 2017 or 18 yeah yeah. i do sometimes wonder about the extent and that's something i kind of explore my thesis is the the role of the bbc so Mm -hmm. as part of because it's funded mostly by um tv license and then partially by taxpayers there's a certain level they so they have to reflect sort of modern diversity and uh they have all the, they have a royal charter with like five aims and one of them is diversity uh reflecting kind of the uk as it is today but at the same time because they uh it's anyone who watches live tv or um bbc iplayer has to pay this license fee there's then that worry of if they go too far in terms of, you know, so for instance, I think black queerness would be quite, uh, it's controversial. It shouldn't be, but it is controversial. And a lot of the people who watch live TV are older generations and they're going to be the ones who are most resistant. And I guess there's maybe a fear of backlash. Again, this is completely me just being hypothetical right now, but I think, yeah, the difference between that versus stars. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. I mean, we have a Canadian equivalent as a Commonwealth country. We have the CBC. And, like, I couldn't see the CBC doing something like Star Spartacus. So, like, I get it. Yeah, I mean, Stars is also, like, it's not on HBO's level. But in terms of, like, being able to have violence and sex, like, it's closer. So, I mean, yeah, the difference is there. But it it does still speak to, like you're saying, like, it's controversial. But it shouldn't be just this, like, very basic idea of like if you're gonna show a kiss between everyone else like maybe you also show the kiss between two black men because it's exactly the same as all the other kisses that you're showing yeah yeah oh my gosh okay well i'm really glad we got to talk about troy fall of the city because it was like huge extra thing um that i did not really know enough about at all but okay um, yeah, I mean, now I've kept you for a while. This has been absolutely fascinating. Are there any other like depictions that you want to mention or talk about at all? Yes, actually. Um, Amazing. <laughs> so um, there's uh, the TV show Hannibal. Okay, I've heard about it, never seen it. I love it. So I'm quite into the fandom of it as well. Um, so I love any excuse to kind of nerd out over the TV show. So for anyone who doesn't know it, it's about Hannibal Lecter and his relationship with this FBI profiler, Will Graham. And it starts off, we're watching and because it's at the time where we were being queer based a lot on TV and we're watching and thinking, oh, okay, this is just another example. But then it starts to kind of become actual, actual, uh, real relationship between the two. 
Um, and there's one scene which I, it's a very minor reference to Achilles and Patroclus, but the fandom just jumps on it and seized it. And it's, um, a, uh, Hannibal Lecter is a very skilled artist and he's drawing uh, a, a painting uh, of Achilles lamenting the death of Patroclus. And it's a Nicol- it's by Nikolai Ge. It's a Russian painter, the original, and he's uh, doing a copy of it. And uh, as Will comes in, he explains the painting and Achilles and Patroclus' relationship. And he very much situates uh, himself as Achilles and Will as Patroclus due to Will's uh, extreme empathy, because that's a very defining feature of Patroclus in ancient sources and later. And I thought it was um, really interesting because it's it was at a time where their relationship was still in the homoerotic realm, but not no one really knew whether where it was going whether we were just being baited again and it really it was clearly being used as this kind of marker of uh homoeroticism and the ambiguity of their relationship as well as kind of like how destructive their relationship is and again i thought it was very interesting as well to see this paint a real painting being uh copied because again achilles and patroclus especially achilles lamenting the death of patroclus is quite a not super popular, but it appears in quite a few paintings in the sort of 18th and 19th centuries. So it was a whole other sort of, it tapped into this whole other reception of Achilles and Patroclus in art, as well as the way in which they could be used as a couple, as signifiers of a homoerotic relationship. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, it it sounds like it also just like, yeah, represents so many different things, like both in terms of the characters and the show and Achilles and Patroclus. I love that. That's, I mean, classical reception in anything uh, is very fun. (laughs) It makes me happy. And then the fan, a lot of fanfic um, was, will quote that or make Achilles and Patroclus uh, metaphors and similes. Um, And then there was some fan art where they would draw um Hannibal Lecter as Achilles in the painting that he was copying and then uh Will Graham as Patroclus so people were then changing the artwork so really this clear identification between the two characters in the mythology versus the show that must be so much fun sometimes to be able to like have it be part of your PhD to kind of look at stuff like fan art and like you mentioned fan fiction at some point i am trying to decide whether the microphone was on or not but like the the idea that that's kind of like part of it and you kind of just get to go and dive into like how everyday people have taken these characters and run with them must be so interesting it really is and it's fun because we see it from even antiquity to today, the whole Alexander and Hephaestion, the way they characterize themselves as Achilles and Patroclus going to visit the tomb of Achilles and laying a wreath or something. Um, so even from antiquity, we've seen people using them as sort of markers of their relationship and it carries on today. And I just think it's, it is, it's utterly fascinating. I love it. I love what I'm studying. Yeah, it's such a fun way of studying the ancient world I mean it does it feels like it connects so much to like what I do with my show which is just being able to like study all of it or like look at everything or like kind of whatever you want at any given moment which just makes it considerably more fun I think (laughs) so um okay I mean god this was so much fun I knew this episode was going to be good but like absolutely even better than I imagined I love talking about this stuff I mean I will talk about the ancient world in any way but like these characters are so interesting and there's so many things like I both did and did not know. So yeah, no, uh, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. I've honestly had such a blast. Um, it's just, yeah, there's so much to talk about. We could talk for hours more because there's so many before any of lis- the listeners say, well, you didn't talk about this or that. I know I've missed so many different receptions, but there's just, I mean, yeah, as it things. is like, we didn't even get to Troy Fall of a City until it was like close to like an hour and a half. And I was like, shit, well, I've, I'm glad you're able to keep talking because I really want to hear about this. Like, yeah, oh, there. And I know there's so much. And like, we didn't even talk about Hades. I just admitted that I had and uh, played it. It's so. fun. I've, I've not looked at it yet for my thesis. I played the game a while ago, but not all the way through. So I never actually completed their side quest. So I don't actually have too much to say on, but I'm going to be looking at sort of fan art as well. 
as part of my chapter on that because I think the fandom is very interesting yeah yeah I mean I've just got this like taste of like whatever people send me which granted is a lot um because if Hades has done anything it's like opened people up to like Orphic tradition which was a whole thing for me for a while because it's and it's wild anyway won't go into that because it's a mess (laughs) um but yeah okay before I just keep going on and on uh, (laughs) let's just thank you so much do you want my listeners to follow you anywhere? Do you like anywhere to learn more or what have you that you want to share? Anything? Oh, yeah. So um, I have my Twitter, which is uh, CG underscore classics. Um, I share memes or if you have memes, please send them to me because I might include them in my PhD thesis, especially if they're about Troy, Troy, Fall of a City, Hades or uh, Song of Achilles. Those are the ones I'm, or fan art. If you see any good fan art, please send it my way. If you can find the actual artist, just, yeah, I I want it all, basically. (laughs) I love that. I bet you're going to get some stuff because if I know my listeners, they feel strongly about Achilles and Patroclus and Hades. Oh, nerds, nerds, nerds. This fucking couple. Am I right? I mean, I absolutely love the idea that for all modern people like to debate now, like whether or not they were in a romantic or sexual relationship or just like good pals, good friends. Um, In the ancient world, they literally just wanted to know like who was the top and who was the bottom or rather who was the dominant one, who was the Erastes, who was the Aramanos. Fucking fascinating. Also, now I might just have to watch Troy Fall of a City, you know, just like five years too late. Thank you all so much for listening, as always. And make sure you follow Charlotte on Twitter because God's the memes. The memes, you guys. Her Twitter is linked in the episode's description, as always. And God's this episode was so much fun. And how could it not be? Because we're talking not only Achilles and Patroclus, but how they appear in modern reception. They're just, they're fascinating. Let's talk about Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians. She handles so many podcast related things. God's just everything, including so much research for that symposium episode. Pfft, Michaela's the best. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. So amazing. The podcast is hosted and monetized by iHeartMedia. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron where you get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. Thank you all. You're super cool. Just like Achilles and Patroclus. I am Liv and I love this shit. Mm